Hello and welcome to Lead Me Home. I am Mary Beth Maestre. So what's in a name? Have you ever Googled your name to see what it means? And have you ever discovered that your name is spot on to what's being what you have discovered? Or maybe it's not quite what, what it is, what your person, it doesn't suit your personality. And this happens to you, might find something in it that suits you, but other little clues are just not of you. Well, my next, next guest has a very special name. And as we go through this show, we're going to see how she acquired her name, what it means, and how appropriate it is for the life she's leading now. So let me welcome my next guest, Sister Mar Maria. Maria. Maria Stella Maris. But we call her Sister Stella Maris. So welcome, Sister. Thank you. Thank welcome you to our show, Lead Me Home. Sister, we always start off with getting a little ba bit of background history. Mm -hmm. Parents, fa uh, family, brothers, sisters, schools. So let's get started. First of all, where were you born? And we move on from there. Well, I was born in England, and I have an Irish mother and an English father. And they moved to Cayman when I was one years old. Mm -hmm. I have an older brother and an older sister. And so we moved to Cayman when we were very young. And it was a bit of paradise for us because the population hadn't grown then. Mm -hmm. And so we were very free as children. We were very free to go to our neighbor's house without any, you know, fear of being kidnapped or anything like that. So we had a, a fantastic childhood growing up in the Cayman Islands. And I guess leaving England, just the sea, mm -hmm. the sea alone. Eh? Yes, then, yes. We grew up in the water, basically. I think I learned how to swim before I learned how to walk. To walk, probably. <laughs> so, and the fear of my mother of us drowning, because we were surrounded by the sea. We had a swimming pool as well. So she put us in swimming lessons very early very so that we, you know, if anything happened, we would be able to swim. So that what brought your parents to, to Cayman? Well, interesting enough, um, when my mother met my father, she really had no desire to get married because she wanted to travel. But ironically enough, or providentially enough, <laughs> she, my father felt the same way. So they agreed that once they got married, they would go somewhere. Okay. And they were both teachers at the time, and they happened to get, my father happened to get a job in Jamaica. Okay. So they lived in Jamaica for five years after they got married. And then things were not um, doing so well economically in Jamaica, and they left and went back to England. And they settled there, but uh, they didn't really settle. They missed the Caribbean. They missed it. Yeah. They tasted it. <laughs> exactly. So like, then, like we say here, they tasted the coconut water, right, right. whatever Jamaica would say as yeah. well. So then we were all, they had the three of us, and then my father got a position as a teacher uh, working for government at the time mm -hmm. and moved to Cayman. And, and you loved every bit of it. Huh? Yes, I that, did. Great, great, great. Okay, so you're going to go to school there, of course. You're being mm -hmm. raised there. What's school, high school, uh, elementary, high school? There was only one Catholic school there. Well, still is one. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to get in there. They were run by a religious community. There were sisters in um, our Catholic school, in the primary school and the high school at the time. And so that's where I attended school. My mother taught at that school, and that was really the only reason we were able to get into that school because it was obviously the mm -hmm. only private school on the island at the time. And of, of course, everyone wanted to get into, yeah, into that. Into the Catholic school. What was the, the faith of your, fam of your parents, your mother? My mother was raised Catholic and was, has always been faithful. And my father wasn't raised anything. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't really have any belief in God. And so it was really my mother that was instilling the faith in us. She, before she got married, she would made it very clear to my father that as children, we would go to a Catholic school and we would be raised Catholic, and he agreed to that. Mm -hmm. But he really had nothing to do with our faith, but he really lived the example of a good Christian life mm -hmm. and really um, taught us very good values in that. Good moral values. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he didn't stop your mother from teaching you all anything about no. the faith. Huh? If anything, if my mother was away, 
he would say, you have to go to church on Sunday, and he would pack us all off, but he wouldn't attend. He wouldn't. But at least he would bring us to church. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. So, so, so he, he, he took on the role as a father. Mm-hmm. He agreed w- with his wife to, that he would raise the kids Catholic. Right. And so he kept faithful to, to that promise yes, yeah. he had made to her. Yeah. Okay, what is school like? School was <laughs> school. School. Um, from the the time I started, I never liked school. Um, I had a great social life, mm-hmm. um, lots of friends. But as far as doing any work, not much that happened. <laughs> <laughs> like many others, <laughs> I did try, but um, I was more interested in just, especially at a young age, with just having fun and mm-hmm. playing outside and. And being with my friends. Okay, but you're gonna imitate your brother in something. Yes. So tell yes. us about that. What is he good in? So, brother, my brother really excelled in many things, but one of them was swimming. And of course, being the youngest and idolizing my brother, I wanted <laughs> to do the same thing. So I took up swimming as well. In fact, all three of us were swimmers. Mm-hmm. And in the beginning, it was just a social thing. Our friends were there, and we were all there too, joining in. But then it became much more competitive mm-hmm. when I was about 12 years old, standard five. But you continued in high school, the swimming. I swam mm-hmm. right through high school. And when I was in high school, it became very competitive. And I would say it was a saving grace for mm-hmm. me because it kept me very disciplined because I wasn't interested in school and more interested in my social life. But because of the hours I was putting in into swimming, I was swimming before I went to school for two hours and then three hours after school. So Even that, at that early age? At that early age. Mm-hmm. So then it was keeping me disciplined. I had to do my homework at school. I was limited time. Yes. So I was forced to, 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 to have more schedule in my life. <laughs> A more schedule, more disciplined, disciplined life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But um, you're going to compete, aren't you? Yes, that was also what probably kept me in swimming was the opportunity to travel. And we traveled all over the world, went all over the Caribbean, competed in the Central and Caribbean Games, um, the Commonwealth Games in Malaysia at the time. And so all over Europe I swam. And so it was a great... I, was a, I wasn't achieving very well academically, but in swimming I was ch- achieving. And <laughs> Way beyond, over, <laughs> right. over and above. Over and above. So it gave me a sense of worth, I think. Yes. That's where I found it. Of accomplishment. Yes. That you had yes. accomplishment. So. <laughs> okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. No, no. <laughs> look, look at where you are today. Right. <laughs> we don't need yeah. school anymore. That's right. Who needs school anyway? Right, right. <laughs> yeah, just extra bits of information. That's all that's it is. Right. All right. Um, having swam and doing so well in swimming, swimming, you get a scholarship, don't you? Yeah. So after high school, um, my my intention was just to leave school and be done with it. Mm-hmm. But my coach was very insistent in trying to persuade me to go to university just because I could get a full scholarship. At the time, there was no way my parents could send me. They didn't have the money to yeah. afford my further education. And so he said, if you look at different schools, it's almost like sending in your resume as a swimmer. This is what I've accomplished in the last year. And then schools around the States will pick you, basically, if they find you, if they want you, they'll Mm -hmm. pay, they'll bid the highest price, basically. So I received a full scholarship to go to Cleveland State University. Cleveland? Cleveland State 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 University. University. Okay. And so... um, that was really the only way, reason I went to university. I wasn't too, again, interested in the academics. <laughs> but the swimming attracted me. Having said all of that, it's just amazing how much you're going to accomplish. Because what, what are you going to study there? I studied psychology. I started doing education. And I thought, gosh, I hate school. Why would I want to do this for the rest of my life? <laughs> so I remember having a conversation with my father. And he's like, I don't care what you do. Just do something. So I was like, okay. And I always found um, a lot of my friends would come to me for advice or some kind of counseling. And even from a young age, I I felt like I had a gift in it. Mm -hmm. And so I took an interest in psychology just from my own kind of experience of it. And so I studied psychology, but I studied it in a secular environment, and which brought up many questions for me. Yes. So Uh I was... Um, studying theory and method 
and all those other things, but I could never have the answer that I wanted with what really heals us, what brings us to full healing. Mm -hmm. um, and I could never see that in my lectures that I was receiving. Thank you. It was, uh, yes, like you said, method, theory. Those were, that's what you were working Which are with. good and yes, essential. Yes, you, you need that, you need to, that. to get you to do. the, to the you know, But um, then there was no kind of... And I would ask my professors and I would be all, and then what? <laughs> yeah. You know, where does this lead? And they never could really answer me. That so um, that began to question, because I myself was wanting some answers for me. I was looking for something more in my life. I, was, I knew that I had... Um, struggles in my own life that I and I wanted answers you for. needed answers for those now you keep up your swimming don't you yes I, at university we there's other um, sports there's Cleveland State is known for its basketball mm -hmm. for its baseball football all of those sports were in the school but the swimmers were known for mm -hmm. their rewards that they had received I was known as athlete of the month I received different um, rewards for that so we were really the top of our game. We were an international um, swimming team. We were from all over the world and we were competing together. So I think it became, for me, a, I was searching for something and I saw, okay, maybe this is it. I'm very popular. People know me. Yes, this is yes. something, you know. I started to date um, the good looking popular guy on the swim team. So now I'm somebody, in my own opinion, and mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. others are sure. saying. So, um, I was feeling pretty good about myself at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. You had it all at this. At that. Mm -hmm. I mean, don't worry about school. I mean, you're, you're getting through school. Right. But now you're swimming. You're popular. The team's doing well. You're traveling still up being with the team, and that's the life. Right. That's the life all of us would envy. Right. All of us at that age yes. would have longed yeah. for a life like yeah. that. Yeah. But there's going to be questions with it. Huh? Yeah. All right. So during that time, um. Christmas, uh, you'd still come home for, 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 for Christmas and summer? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm living um, my college life, which was a lot of social life. I was with becoming a popular, being popular on the swim team. It came a great social life, lots of parties, lots of going out. So I was living that life. Mm -hmm. and, but at the same time, I was going home and for Christmas and summer and living this almost this double life because people knew me as the girl that goes to church with her family, the girl that's oh, very good and achieved great things. She went to all of these great swim events and got a scholarship. So it was living two lives at the same time. I was living a party life at college and university and living it up. Well, I thought I was living it up <laughs> and then having this life at home. Uh -huh. And it left me very broken. It left me very empty because um, I was, I always struggled. I didn't realize this till much later, but I was struggling within my, myself of struggling with knowing who I was and my worth and my dignity. I w it was just broken. It had been broken so badly from my childhood and what I experienced in my childhood because my father as loving as he was, he wasn't very um, emotionally visible and attentive, and that left me very broken. And so I was seeking that within my relationships. I was looking for something more. Okay, and we're co we're coming to the to the, uh, a break right now. But before we go to that quickly, you had a, a boyfriend in high school. What was that? Tell okay. me a little bit about that story. Yes, it, he wasn't. He we didn't actually date, but we were very very good friends, friends. very yeah. close. And um, we swam together, and he was, he was just a very good, he was actually the pastor, the Baptist pastor's son. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> and he was just lovely. He was a very, very good, good friend, um, loved life, lived it to the fullest mm -hmm. in such a beautiful way. And he would always say these things, like, you're, so, you're such a good person. And he would say, he would express to me quite often his love for me, mm -hmm. but I never could take it serious. I never... I never those words, if someone says they love you, usually it penetrates you. You feel good about yourself, but it never did. It never penetrated. Mm -hmm. It never um, made me react in any way. I did, didn't take him seriously at all. And so we stayed extremely good friends, um, but I never, 
I never realized how much later that yes, he really did love what, me. What yes, yeah, it's going to take you going through other experiences to come back to yes. understand yes. what what he was saying yes. and, and the depth of what he was offering yes, as, exactly. as a young boy. Exactly. But I, but I'm sure a lot of it came from his faith. Mm-hmm. You know, going to his hearing. I mean, being with God too in, right. in his Baptist faith. Huh? Right. So right. I think later on you'll see yes. some of that. Yes. Okay, sister, we'll stop there and we'll continue. Okay. Viewers, we're, we're going to stop here and take a break. And when we come back, we'll continue on Sister Stella Maris's story and we'll come to that point where we see when we find out more about her name. But in the meantime, understand that she's struggling. She's struggling with some sort of self-esteem. And with that too, we're going to see how that's going to get resolved in several ways. We'll be right back. For victory in life, we've got to keep focused on the goal, and the goal is heaven. The key to winning is choosing to do God's will and love others with all you've got. Sacrifice, discipline, and prayer are essential. We gain strength through God's word, and we receive grace from the sacraments. And when we fumble due to sin and it's going to happen, confession puts us back on the field. So if you haven't been going to Mass Weekly, get back in the game. We're saving your seat on the starting bench this Sunday. Welcome home. Hello and welcome back. I am Mary Beth Maestri and my guest is Sister Stella Maris. What we didn't mention, Sister, is you're from the Salt Order. So we, we've, um, I've had a Sister Mary Peter here before, and that's the Society of Our Lady, Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. Of the Most Holy Trinity. And Sister is stationed here at the Divine Might Mercy Parish. Okay, so Sister, let's continue. You go home, back to Cayman for your, um, for your vacations, and a double life. You're mm-hmm. sort of living, living your a life. And I would have thought just the opposite. I thought, you know, Cayman is like the Caribbean, so you're partying there every weekend. But then, of course, you have your parents there. That's a different right. story. Right. And everybody knows you. Small town. That's right. <laughs> just like we were. Just we, we were compared to what we are today. I'm thinking in my days, mm-hmm. too. We were much smaller than everyone knew mm-hmm. everyone else. So sure. Um, but over there, there are no parents. So you can do as you please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you go back to, to university after one of these summer vacations. What's going to happen? Well, um, at the time, I was, like I said, I was dating, dating someone, and I thought it was he was the one, and it was very serious. And I went home for summer and um, came back after school, after summer, and came back to school. And one of my roommate at the time, um, she was being a bit strange and because uh, I was talking to her about my boyfriend at the time and she's like, uh, don't you know that he's dating, she, he's dating Jessica? And I said, no. <laughs> and so Jessica was my best friend at the time. And so mm-hmm. this all came out, came out and obviously crushed me. Mm-hmm. And I went back to school, um, just devastated really. Mm-hmm. But... I was reminded that when I was dating this boy, I would go to church and one of my prayers was, Our Lady, if this relationship is not good for me and not of you, then let it, let it end. I did, I did, you know, Mm -hmm. make that prayer. So I was reminded of that later, but at the time I was so devastated. And the reason I was so broken was, to me, it was just a confirmation of everything I was struggling with inside, Uh that I wasn't lovable that someone could betray me so much like this. Like it was just like a knife going through me. And it was, it was really hard. In fact, I almost failed out of school. Like I just struggled with studying and with swimming and everything. It just kind of all came tumbling down. But it was, there was a deeper brokenness to that. There was more to it than just you know, than the just aches. what was on the surface. Exactly, yeah. the aches. Because it wasn't one betrayal, it was two. Your boyfriend yeah. and, and your best, best friend. friend. So that's yeah. like double whammy, as we yeah. say. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that was, and, and I think like you mentioned, psychology doesn't help with that right. part of right. it. Huh? It yes. gives you theory and method, but it doesn't know how to mend a broken no, heart. it certainly doesn't. <laughs> yeah. It certainly so doesn't. You had, so that's where you're still searching. Yes. Okay. That, that couldn't be fixed. And so 
um, the social life became more the way to escape and so yes. the late nights were more you know <laughs> <laughs> and right. so this was all also affecting my schoolwork mm -hmm. and at one point my coach says if you fail any more classes we're cutting you from the scholarship that's yeah. it for you so I had to really kind of shook you up shook me up <laughs> and made me think okay. and that mm -hmm. was that was when um I was very close to my roommate my freshman year. She, her and I were very close and she left. She didn't finish school, she left. But I stayed in touch with her. She was mm -hmm. from that state at the time. So I used to visit her during Thanksgiving because okay. I couldn't go home, so I went to her house. And um, so after this breakup, we were spending uh, quite a lot of time together and I was spending the night at her house and we were up late talking. Mm -hmm. And she was talking to me about falling in love with her boyfriend that she was with now and ma and she was thinking seriously of marrying him and so she asked me at the end of that conversation well what are you going to do with your life like are you going to get married and I said to her no I think God is calling me to a religious vocation and I honestly don't know where that came from it was like the Holy Spirit just kind of came out of me. It, <laughs> yeah, out. it really was. But her response was very significant. She said, it takes a strong person to do that. And it takes a strong, strong person, person to do, to do that. that. Which was huge because for me it was very important, her reaction, because my fear, I think, without really realizing it, was that what are people going to think? Could I live this life? Those were deep questions mm -hmm. down inside of, uh -huh. inside of me. And her response was so powerful and so simple, but very, very significant. Yeah. And 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 you probably like we were talking about that was Holy Spirit speaking through both of you. Absolutely, what yes. you said and what her reply was. Yes, because you said after that you didn't even think about it again. No, it wasn't. She didn't wasn't, mention. I didn't mention. We just kept on going. Okay. I kept living my life, mm -hmm. and it was funny because. Um, Often people ask me, well, how did you know you were going to be a sister? Mm -hmm. You know it's in the depths of you. You know yeah. it really is in the depths of you. And um, most people that have had a religious voc who have a religious vocation can look back over their life and see yes. how the Spirit was moving them. Uh -huh. So, so that was an example right there, yeah, it was. Where, <laughs> where a spirit knew way ahead of you. Yes, <laughs> it was, yes and yeah, there was a little prompting. In this little signs, yeah, yes, going. Yeah. Okay, so you graduate, you're going to graduate. I graduate um, two years after that, so I recovered from the breakup somewhat, and I graduated and went home, and I really didn't know what particularly I wanted to do. Yeah. I had this degree that was pretty useless, because unless you have a master's in psychology, you can't actually counsel or be, oh, you, can't, okay. you can't really you need, do much with that. it. So I went into um, working in a big hotel in the Ritz-Carlton, in Cayman and I was kind of a manager assistant with running the children's program there and I hated it. <laughs> because but it was with children. <laughs> it was with children. They were great. But I was faced with, you know, the society of the world, everything that everyone dreams of. Mm -hmm. The money was abundant and the, you know, everything was laid out and um, the people that I worked with wanted this life so badly and there was competitive backbiting and stabbing to get to the top and everybody wanted it and it was so false and so empty mm -hmm. for me. I didn't want anything. It was not having any desires to be at the top of anything really. <laughs> and, so, and so I just couldn't settle. It wasn't for me. It's not what I was wanting. So I, I was with them for about a year mm -hmm. and decided, no, this is not for me. That's not, that's yeah. not you wanted. Yeah. But in the meantime now, you're, tell me about your older sister. So in the meantime, she, my sister had joined the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity and she had been there for three years now. Mm -hmm. So she was coming up to taking her first vows and so she was coming home during the summer. So I did see her in the summers, uh -huh. um, but she wasn't too much. Um, in my life at the time. But when she came home that summer, um, I really talked to her seriously about going on mission. And at the time she was in, um, she was actually in Rome at the time. She was studying in Rome. Yeah. And my brother also had joined Our Lady of Most Holy Trinity Society. And he was in Benke. He uh -huh. was serving in Benke at the time. Mm 
Sister, can we stop there? Viewers, are you hearing this? This is a Catholic mother, non-practicing anything father, three children, and all three enter the society, the salt society, society of Our Lady. Yeah. So your older sister first, then your brother, and now, no, not you yet, because not you yet. still hadn't even considered it yet. No. Yeah. But we'll come back to that. Let's, let's continue on. But think about that one. <laughs> now, so she, you, you're talking to her, and you're just looking for mission. Right. You just right. Want, mm -hmm. Well, that summer, just before I had this conversation with her, I had gone to England to visit family. Mm -hmm. And I was holidaying there with my mom and dad. And as I came back to Cayman on the airplane, I had a very distinct kind of voice tell me, you will be back there. And I thought, why on earth would I turn around and go back go to back England? In. <laughs> <laughs> it's not some place I really had a desire to go. Mm -hmm. But then when I came back home and I was talking to my sister, I said, I really have a desire to go to Mission, but I don't want to go to North Dakota and I don't want to go to Belize. And they were the two missions that received volunteers for the society. Mm -hmm. And so she said, well, I don't know where else you could go. And then all of a sudden she said, well, you could try Wales. There are some sisters in Wales mm -hmm. who could try and ask and see if you could go there. So I emailed the sister in charge right away and she said, yes, come as soon as you want. Go over to us. So in that September, this, this was all happening in July, August. And in that September, I found myself in Wales. But, but like you said, it was, you also said something today, the effect that Obviously, I mean, your mother had instilled a lot in you because you knew John, John Paul II's words of not only evangelizing, but I think something to youth, telling the youth to at least give one year of their life. To, that, that's right. The year before that, I had actually attended World Youth Day. And oh, okay. So you did and, you know, go to World Youth I Day. I went to World Youth Day. Uh -huh. uh, both my brother and I went. And uh -huh. at that time when John Paul spoke, he was encouraging the youth to go on mission, he said, give your life, one, give one year of your one life year. to mission, uh -huh. live a sacrificial life basically, mm -hmm. uh, free from all things and just give of yourself. And, and for others. And, and for, others. for others. And so that always rang true in, in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, so that's basically what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. You wanted to go to Wales to do, give your one life to mission, not thinking at all of, the, of, religious of, of a religious life no. at all. Okay, so you get to Wales, and what's what happens there? <laughs> so at Wales, and during Wales, the time of Wales, I actually arrived there, and I had one week there, and I said, my goodness, this is not for me. <laughs> I didn't like the weather, I didn't like the mission, there was nothing about it that I liked. Mm -hmm. But there was something deep in me that said, if you leave, your life will never be the same. It was a very pivotal point in my in my journey. Mm -hmm. um, I really felt um, this unknown force keeping me there. And so I, I was like, okay, I'll stay. Um, and it was a fantastic year. We worked in a small town and I used to visit people homebound and we did door-to-door -door evangelization. And it was a really opportunity. I'm not sure if you know, Wales is a pagan country. <laughs> yeah. And um, it really is you mean the, compared to Ireland at the time? <laughs> at the time, <laughs> yeah. it's it's very it was open persecution mm -hmm. at the time. Um, people had no problems telling you um, they didn't approve of your your mm -hmm. religion. Mm -hmm. But it was a very powerful experience for me in that I really was fighting for what I believed in, and I loved what I believed in, and so it was it was a learn it was a learning a year of really learning okay. a lot about my all right faith. so then with that you come back home i come back after that year i came back home and um at that time my sister was preparing to take her first vows and so i went to our annual assembly in mm -hmm. corpus christi in july and at that I, it was at that assembly that i met my spiritual director whom i had been in contact with quite a lot and he just took one look at me and he said, you're ready. And he didn't say anything more. Yes. He just knew, he just said that. And I knew everything that I had been secretly fighting against. Searching, was, yes, was, yes. Was, was, the doors were open and I realized, yes. And I'm, he I'm could supposed, see it. Yeah. You hadn't seen it yet. I hadn't but seen he, it. Everyone else had seen, seen it. it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went home 
after J July, uh, being there for two weeks, I went home and I started processing my visa to join Aspirancy, which is the first stage of formation. Okay, what we, we, we call that word Aspirancy. Aspirancy. Okay, let's learn it. When we had just I had Jessica on, and she will take Aspirancy. Um, in, in February, yeah? next year, February. Mm -hmm. So you had your, it's one or two years? It, well, I had one year. Of one it. year mm -hmm. of aspirancy. Mm -hmm. And tell us a little bit of what that is. So aspirancy, a lot of women, when they think, if I commit to this, mm -hmm. if I start formation in religious order, it means the minute I walk through that door, I'm, I'm going to become a sister. <laughs> and I really didn't go with that. In uh -huh. fact, I had, it was beautiful that my sister told me that because I was, I was panicking about this because yes, I wasn't sure. ready. Uh -huh. I didn't feel like I was ready. And she said, you're just going to discern. That's, that's uh -huh. all you're doing. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that's really what aspirance is. You're going to live the life of a sister and you're going to see, is this life for me? And is this community, this particular religious community, for me? Okay, so do th two, two things. things you're discerning. Is it is it for me, for any of those young aspirants <laughs> out there? All it is is to ask. You ask the question: Is this something I could do? And is this the community I would like to be in? Yeah. Because there's so many so other many orders you could join. Right. Huh? But you, you're, uh -huh. Yeah, and at the time too, your, your superior is helping you discern that. Discern that uh -huh. um, so she might say, oh, I think you're more uh, fitted for contemplative order. Contempl uh -huh. So mm -hmm. at the end of that six months, you take, you take a, a seven-day retreat. That's kind of your final discernment. And then if you feel, then you move on to the next stage. For me, I started, because I started in September, I did my, four, sorry, four months. Um, but uh, potency didn't start until the year August. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I went to Kansas City and I did another four months. So I was, my oh, aspirance was a year. Okay, a year of discerning. Discerning. A year of discerning. Mm -hmm. And we're wrapping up, but after you discern now, you got, the next stage is going to be? Potency. Pos and, and what, okay, let's just go quickly through pos potency. is a more contemplative year and you're, okay. you're, teach you're receiving a lot of teachings about the society, about religious life, and you're doing a lot of prayer and spiritual direction and really forming yourself. At the end of potency, another retreat is given and you discern to take that step where you receive your, your habit. And so now you're dressed as a sister, you have a white veil and a habit. And so now you're going to live the life even more fully as a novice for two years. So you're dressed as a sister and living their life for two years. Okay, let's stop there. We didn't get to her name. We will as we get as soon as we come back. So now sister has her, her spiritual director has seen it in her, encourages her. So she does aspirancy, which is one year. And that's, and, and keep in mind, the salt order is missionary community. It's a missionary so community. that, this particular order is to be out in the missions mm -hmm. and among the community. Mm -hmm. Basically, you'll just take the two words, yeah. a missionary community. That's right. So, so that's what you're doing. So you've done aspirancy and into postulancy. We'll continue. When we get when we come back on the rest the other stages of sister's life be right back for victory in life we've got to keep focused on the goal and the goal is heaven the key to winning is choosing to do god's will and love others with all you've got Sacrifice, discipline, and prayer are essential. We gain strength through God's Word, and we receive grace from the sacraments. And when we fumble due to sin, and it's going to happen, confession puts us back on the field. So if you haven't been going to Mass weekly, get back in the game. We're saving your seat on the starting bench this Sunday. Welcome home. Welcome back, and let's continue. Now, we say Sister jo went through aspirancy, a year of that, which means just discerning. Is this something I'm even interested in? Not to frighten anyone, just come and see. Someone cuts what they call it also, huh? like a come and see what this is all about. Sister took the last retreat, took a retreat, 
and continue to move on to postulancy. And in postulancy, part of that is receiving your habit. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. A habit, but your, that your veil is white. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you're going to do how many years are you going to do postulancy? So you just do a year of postulancy. One year of postulancy. Mm -hmm. and, and you receive the habit and go into two years of novitiate. One of those years is, is active. You're active in the missions. Uh -huh. And then the second year is more contemplative. Contemplative, which is beautiful. Huh? You have to experience both. Mm -hmm. The activity of being out there, but you can never, ever do that unless you have that, that inner relationship with God. And that's what the contemplative part of it is, huh? yes. to getting to, to know God deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get into Sister's name. So at what point, is it at postulancy that you get to pick the name comes up? Um, some people know from postulancy, but I didn't. When did um, for me, my second novitiate year, so in the, the year that's more contemplative, okay. I was actually the first thing you do when you arrive is do a seven-day seven retreat. Uh -huh. And I actually painted a picture of Our Lady holding a child walking across the sea. Mm -hmm. And to me, I loved it. It just came to me and I painted it. But it didn't mean that was it. There was nothing kind of more than that. It was just a beautiful picture. Mm -hmm. And then when it came at the end of the year, you take another seven-day retreat and you're discerning. Well, the whole year you're kind of discerning your name, yeah. mm -hmm. what it is. Because you receive, like the apostles, they received another name. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a sign of... God is giving you another mission. Yes. It's another part. It's another step in your life. So I received that. Um, I, as in our community, you can write three names that you feel you're called to, and then our founder discerns it. And then on the day of your vows, you receive that name. Uh -huh. You have no idea what you're getting. Oh, of the three that you <laughs> of submit. Of the three you don't know, you don't know until the day you take, receive your vows. Oh, I see. Which is kind of beautiful and exciting. Yes, uh -huh. And I submitted two I submitted my baptismal name, which was Christina, uh -huh. and I love that. It had so much meaning for me. Uh, Christina means anointed one, and that was very significant in my life. I love the name um, because it just spoke to me of it has Christ in it, and I was very, yeah. I always had a strong relationship with to Jesus. Christ. Uh -huh. So the name meant a lot to me. And so I wrote this long paragraph of, of why I should have this name. Christina. Yes, Christina. Mm -hmm. And then in the end, I said, and Stella Morris. And the only reason why I wrote that was in postulancy, one of my sisters said to me, you should take the name Stella Morris. And I was like, mm, mm, no. <laughs> that was kind of my reaction to it. But then, so I wrote it and I said, I, would want, I want this name solely, two sentences, was Our Lady was very significant in my life, and she guided me through some very, very dark times in my life. Mm -hmm. And to me, Stella Maris was that. She is the light that leads us through darkness. And Stella, Stella Maris means star of the sea, and she was very mm -hmm. much a star in my life. She was very much that light. She was always a hid hidden. Uh -huh. I didn't really pray to Our Lady much, but she was always there. So I wrote this, and then... Of course, on the day that I received my vows, they announced Stella Maris. That's the name yeah. Stella Maris. And it began to unfold even more mm -hmm. as I went through, as I become a religious. Yeah. I love it. Mm -hmm. you know. Okay, so viewers hear that. Her name is Stella Maris. Now, we've heard that name. We've that heard that name in relationship to our own um, Stella school. school, Stella Maris School. And now we can see the connection too. And it means star of the sea. Think of it. I, I, I loved it when she told me. And I also saw her picture. Well, well, we'll show the picture. on. Um, you'll see the picture. Uh, star of the sea. Now, remember, sister grows up and came in. And there's sea all around her. Not only that, she's a swimmer. Mm -hmm. So she's always in the pool. So I thought, how appropriate to have that name, star of the sea. And I looked it up myself. And it's also... Um, it's, uh, you said you had a little story about um, some monks, huh? Some monks were traveling in the dark? Well, traditionally, that's where the name came from. from uh -huh. um, it's also a reference to a passage in Isaiah, but it came from monks who were fleeing from persecution at the time. Mm -hmm. And the only way they could go was get in a boat and, and travel across the sea. And it was midnight when they did this, mm -hmm. and they had to do it secretly. And so they had no light, and they didn't know where they were going. And they describe seeing a light 
that looked like a star that directed him to the shore in safety. And then they could see clearly it was a vision of Our Lady. And so that name came to them, came Stella Maris. Stella Maris, Star of the Sea. Of the sea. Mm -hmm. And it's all, she's also a protector of seafarers. So if you're out at sea, call on Stella Maris. <laughs> call on the Star of the Sea. That's our protect, protectress at sea. All right. And um, you say she's also the one that's bringing you closer. Now mm -hmm. that you've come to understand that name and work with that name, brought you closer and closer to Jesus, didn't she? Absolutely. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. She's been very significant in my life. Okay. So now you have your name, you have your habit. And what, what's this is now like two, three years into it? Yes. Three years. And what else you know, you're going to go into? So now after novitiate, you receive your, your first vow, mm -hmm. your name, and then you are receive an assignment. Okay. So on the day that you take your vows, they assign you to a mission. And our community has missions all over the world. Mm -hmm. Again, you don't know where you're going. It's found, you found out on the day. And so they sent me back to Kansas City. Okay. And so I served there for a year. There's a Montessori school there uh -huh. that we own. And so I was serving in the Montessori school there for a year, which I loved. I loved being with the children. But then at the, the end of that year, they moved me to Ghana, mm -hmm. where I served. Partly the reason why they had to move me was my visa ran out. <laughs> So it was kind of Oh, fun. that's right. Now you're not American. <laughs> yeah, you're <right>. a man. <laughs> so off I went to um, be in Ghana. And that mission had just opened, and it was fantastic. I was assigned to be the secretary of the archbishop there, which was a real adventure. Oh, I could imagine. Yeah. I got to go to places normally that women wouldn't be allowed. It's, Ghana is 90% Muslim, and so many of the meetings that the bishop would have would be strictly men only but since i was the secretary i could go yeah, into these temples and i could go to these places and these different villages that were forbidden for women so it was quite an adventure for me definitely. and you said meeting the, the people the people just so the, was so different the huh? people were fantastic it really was an amazing experience for me everything that i it was like going back in time the western world lives for time and for um, achievement and to get ahead of the world, whereas in Ghana they live for family and relationship and time doesn't exist for them. Yeah. So if you can imagine yeah, the society like that, worlds, yeah. completely different worlds. Yeah. So it was really beautiful to experience that. Okay then, Ghana, you're back home, back to, um, you continue, you come back and your next, is it that another stage is going to, we can give it a name? No, novitiate is stays. This, once you take your first vows, oh, uh -huh. then you're you're officially a sister. Sister. So okay. then I um, I went after Ghana. I went to Benke. I was assigned to Benke, so. and I was in Benke for two years. And while I was in Benke, I wanted to do something more with my my education. I had a real desire to um, go deeper with my counseling. So I was given permission to do an online course, master's course in psychology. And while I was doing that, I was doing a little bit of counseling and um, helping out in the schools where I could with that, which was fantastic. And then after two years in Benke, I you was assigned here. To Belize. Before we go there, um, so now your brother has, by that time, become a priest. Mm -hmm. He had done his time in Benke. Mm -hmm. And where is he now? He's in Nuevo Laredo in Mexico, in, He's serving there. In New, New Mexico. In Mexico. Mexico, yeah. Mexico yeah. cities, Mexico itself, yeah. the country of Mexico, mm -hmm. okay. And your sister, what happened to her? So when I became a novice, she left the community. She was still in a, the time of discernment uh -huh. and she joined another community, mm -hmm. uh, a lay community, and she served there for a few years. And then eventually she left that community. So she's been discerning for a while. Okay. <laughs> and uh -huh. she's now um, studying iconography mm -hmm. and really enjoying that. Doing what yeah. she's doing. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. So her, her, her sister tr discerned for with the souls and discerned with lay community, both of them for about three years. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. It certainly, I am positive, made her a, a, a more... Um, Christ-filled person in whatever role she takes mm -hmm. on, if she gets married, if she stays single, mm -hmm. whatever job she does. 
this background that she brings with her will take her way above just a normal, se the secular world yeah. we're living in. Eh? Yeah. And, and you said her job is iconography. Mm -hmm. That's a painting, or you call it, you said you call it writing. Writing, eh? right, because you're the, praying as you're... Oh, painting. you pray as, okay. So yeah. even, if, even the field she's in yeah. is still a very spiritual one. Yeah. But I still say, think of it, parents that have three kids, and now, so even though her, her older sister got out, two of them, huh? her brother's a priest, the sister is a, is a salt, a nun, a, a nun for the salt order. All right, so now you're here in Belize, so two years in Benke, and you move to Belize, and you're going to be here, you're here for a year and a half. And in July, so the real icing on the cake now. <laughs> so in July, then I received my final vows. Uh -huh. So... All in all, discernment for a religious vocation in our community, it does vary in different communities. A more contemplative community may have lesser time. Mm -hmm. But in our community, it's about nine years of discernment. Okay. Uh -huh. um, so after that, I received my final vows. So it's your final yes to, to religious life. Yes, this is what I'm going to, mm -hmm. to live my life. So that was an incredible moment. It's really something to, there was eight of us that received our final vows and it was very powerful and I guess I've just been on my honeymoon since then. <laughs> it's, been, <laughs> been, it's been a real blessing. blessing. So, yeah. I asked Sister for some of her, um, from her, her Bible verses and she gave me one and I pulled it up and that was from Psalm 45, 11 and 12. And it says, Hear, O daughter, and see, Turn your ear, forget your people and your father's house. So shall the king desire your beauty, for he is your Lord, and you must worship him. Then I added on verse 16. I kept reading and I couldn't resist this one too. <laughs> they are born in with gladness and joy. They enter the palace of the king. And that's so beautiful. So she's left her father's house. She's come, the king desires her beauty. So now talking about low self-esteem, she realizes high esteem in the <laughs> eyes of the Lord. Huh? He sees you as beautiful. Mm -hmm. And for he is the Lord and you must worship him. And you enter in with gladness and joy. Beautiful, sister. Thank you so much. But also, you had told me um, you also liked Matthew. In Matthew, mm -hmm. uh, Jesus walking on the sea and uh, Peter. Yes. What, that was a very significant verse for me because <laughs> it's actually on my holy card. Um, as Peter and his disciples are in the boat, Jesus is walking on the water. And Peter says, Lord, if it is you, bid me come to you. Mm -hmm. And and Christ has come and just the power of those words come it means I give you everything I give you permission you you know I say yes come and Peter has the grace to step out of the boat and if you can imagine if you've been on the ocean when it's it's pitch dark and I have the waves are big and you're about to step out of a boat into this huge into these huge waves and walk across the water to Jesus so just that words come it just reiterates to me the power of Christ um, and the trust that we can have in him to, to walk on water in the midst of darkness and waves and everything that's going on in our life. And Peter gets out and he walks, you know, so. And all, all of us have experienced that, whether we like it or not, whether mm -hmm. we want to, to admit it or not, we have walked on water one way <laughs> or the other because we've had to call on that God of ours. Uh, mm -hmm. And like you said, he just says, come. Yeah. And if we have the trust, because he also reaches out his hand uh, to mm -hmm. Peter, if we can trust and reach our hand back out to hold on to his, mm -hmm. he will take us to the places we yes. never imagined. <laughs> yes, yeah. Sister, we're winding down. So here you are. Now you, uh, you came back after July. You, did, you only went for a couple of weeks anyway. Mm -hmm. So you're back here in Belize City, and you're, that's the mission you're stationed at right for now, now yeah. here in Belize. Uh -huh. And uh, so tell me, um, what, what, what's your life like today? And so, here, here at the parish, yes, Divine Mercy Parish. The parish. Mm -hmm. um, again, a lot of the religious communities that you see around Belize, they're teaching orders. So they're based in a school. Whereas Society of Our Lady, they go 
to a mission where the bishop has invited them and they serve under the needs of the bishop, under the needs of, of, of what the bishop desires for his, um, his Catholic community. So that can be very broad for us. Our sisters are in giving retreats, they're counselors, they're nurses, they're teachers. There's a broad spectrum of things we do. Here in Divine Mercy, um, at the moment, I'm teaching in the Montessori school. I help out there. And I help out with running retreats. Um, I teach, I help out or I'm with the youth, for youth, um, the youth group, youth choir, um, and anything else that really the parish is, is needing or asking of um, to serve in those areas. Yeah, because you also help it, you know, uh, distribute uh, with c the blood of Christ, mm -hmm. with, with lecturing, anything in the church itself. It's right. the mass itself to do yeah. with the mass. So it's just uh, one of those, and uh, you know, those. Um, I always say in hospitality, you give your job description, and at the end, and any other job <laughs> that is required right. of you. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, so that's what's t ticked on at the end of your job description, <laughs> yeah. uh, whatever else yeah. comes up. Yeah. But it's beautiful to see Sister at Mass on Sunday because we have the, the kids come in from, where are, they, where are they coming from? Well, we have kids from all over, kids all over. that are desiring to receive the sacra sacraments. And mm -hmm. so we have the kids coming from different schools, coming to our church. And not necessarily their parents are um, supportive or coming themselves, but these kids have choos chosen, chosen to, come to come and desire something mm -hmm. more. Something but they more. sit beside Sister, or all the, any of the nuns, and they want to touch them. They, they want to even climb on your lap, some yeah, of them. Huh? Yeah. just want to be so close to you. It's yeah. beautiful to, look, to see all of it taking place. All right, so Sister has a full job. Believe me, I don't even know how I was able to get her here. <laughs> I had to bribe her. <laughs> Two candies, <laughs> maybe oh, no. afterwards. <laughs> a, a, a swimming lesson. <laughs> Sister, whatever happened to your swimming? Do you still swim? I do when I get the chance. When you get the opportunity. I'm not, I, by any means, mm -hmm. doing competitive swimming. <laughs> so, yeah. You could come be with me. You <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Go way past me, sister. Thank you so much for being here. But 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 one thing you might, I must say, you left Cayman, but you came to Belize, so you're still yes, seeing the sea right, right right out that there again. Right. So that's what one beautiful thing Belize has to offer mm -hmm. for you specifically. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much, sister, well, for sharing you. your story. It's been a, a it's been a I don't a, just a lovely you know going up and down. It's it's a little in and outs and. Slightly different from other ones, but I've enjoyed it. I've Thank enjoyed you. hearing you telling it and sharing the time we did to get, you know, together, you. learning more about your life. Thank you. Now, when I see you in church, I can think, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know what she was up to. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, to I'm not telling you certain parts. <laughs> no, 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 nothing like that at all. Viewers, thank you. Thank you for being here with us. I hope Sister's story has touched someone out there. And even if you all are mothers, please understand too, I've mentioned this before, the beauty of a praying mother, not only a praying mother, a praying grandmother. Mm -hmm. Remember, her mother and grandmother were Irish. And we know back, well, still, I think, we have good Irish praying women as far as we know. So she had a, a mother and grandmother that prayed for her children. And look, look at the results. Look what um, took place in, in their lives. So thank you. Maybe you can show some young, young girl who's thinking about it, thinking of, of joining an order and has no idea where to go next. Come and speak to the sisters here. We have sis the, sis the Soul Sisters, and this is a missionary community. So maybe someone you know would be interested. Encourage them to look at this show. So thank you once again. Thank you to our cameramen, M Mark and Lewis, and thank you, Tom Peterson, who lends us his evangelicals that we play on this show. Every, every week we see one of Tom Peterson's evangelicals. And just a reminder, anyone who would like to share their story with us, please call us here at Guadalupe Media, 223-3311. And again, this show airs later on tonight at 10 o'clock, 8 o'clock on Thursdays and 10, 10 o'clock p.m. On Fridays, 6.30 a.m., 10 a.m. 
and again on Sunday at 5 p.m. Thank you, viewers. God bless you. God loves you.